I'm going to start recording. Okay, we're recording and Pam, I'm going to make you host before I uh, go away. I don't see any participants other than just those of us on the screen. Yeah, nobody's come in yet. Yeah. Have you started recording yet? Yes, we're recording. Great. Then I'll start the meeting. It is no, we have a boring agenda when nobody's <laughs> this is this is exciting. Um it is August 17, 2023. It is the regular meeting of the Community Resource Committee, Community Resources Committee of the Town Council, pursuant to Chapter 20, the Act of 21, extended by Chapter 22 and 107, the Act of 2022, and extended by Chapter 2 of the Act of 2023. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone with instructions on our website. Uh, there is no in-person attendance of members or, or the committee, um, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. So can we hear and be heard? Uh, Jennifer? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> uh, Pat? Yep. Pam, yes. We are missing Shalini. And uh, we know that Mandy is not here. So there are the three of us. And we'll just keep an eye out for Shalini. Um, the agenda, as you know, um, had the action items of the residential rental bylaw, but we have pretty much um, passed that on. Um, I think the finance committee will talk about um, the fee structure, fee and structure on the 22nd in their meeting. Um, so I am not planning to talk or spend any time on that topic today. Um, what I do want to spend a lot of time on is uh, the general bylaw. Uh, nuisance, nuisance House, a.k.a. Nuisance Property. And I see that John is here as a spokesperson for the department who would help administer this. So that's really helpful. Um, what occurred to me, and I don't know if you all you saw the you saw the version, which was actually produced back in February. So it has been a really long time since we have talked about this particular part of the package. The first parts being um Shalini is now present. Good, great. Shalini, can you hear us? Yes, present. Wonderful. So we're here. Um, I was just saying that the this this document hasn't been talked about since February, so it's really been it's been on the shelf for a while. It um, it feels like a pretty important part of the whole package with the rental bylaw um, regulations and this and this nuisance bylaw um, upgrade. Um, and let me just see, there still is nobody in the audience, so I'm not going to talk about public comment right now, but we'll have general public comment after we've talked about nuisance house, nuisance bylaw. Um, I do want to reserve about 20, 30 minutes, if, if that feels right, to talk about the um, housing trust questions that were posed to us, and I just want to make sure that we have enough time to do that at the end um, before public comment. So let, um, let's go into this and I'm gonna to try to share my screen. I took a, a clean copy of that um, nuisance bylaw just because it's so busy with all the subtractions, additions and put it into basic text. So um, if someone actually will help keep track of uh, if there are attendant, attendees that come in from the public, that'd be really helpful to me because once I start sharing my screen, um, I may not be able to see them. So can you see the document? Yes. Okay, great. And I'm gonna to try to enlarge it. Is that as large as it gets? 
quick question, Pam. If we do see people in the audience, what do you want us to do? Um, just let me know, I guess, so that I can stop and pause and say we'll have public comment following. Okay, this. got Thank it. You. Yeah, thanks. Um, before I start reading this, though, were there were there any um, basic questions that you all had about the this document? Not just questions, but just comments. Melanie? You're muted, Shalini. Sorry. Yeah. I was wondering if you need to relook at the definition of public nuisance, given that we are including more than noise. Like right now, it says the quiet enjoyment. And but if you're including plants and overgrowth and parking and a lot of these things, then maybe we need to expand that definition. Do you mean the title then, as in public nuisance or public or uh, nuisance property? I think was the proposed. Um, I mean, uh, in the later on, when we say when we define what public nuisance is, it generally sounds like more related to noise. Or let me see. Oh wait, what was I looking at earlier? Oh wait, this does include. Let me see. I was looking later down and I thought it only referred to the quiet enjoyment, but here it does say it includes vehicle, illegal parking, public urination, fights, disturbance. Okay, so it does sort of include littering and... Section section B actually talks pretty... Uh, right. ...depth about what which might be included. Why? Oh. Where was I um, reading that? Okay, I, when we come to that, I can come to it. But I thought I read that it was the quiet enjoyment. Um, but it sounds. Oh. To be able to include. Oh, yeah, it was. Sometimes used peaceful. Right. Okay, never mind. Let's go on. I will come back to it. Um, Jennifer, you're Sorry. Yeah, I usually, I think I've heard the word used, um, peaceful enjoyment of yeah. one's home. More than quiet. You know, a little difference. So we might just want to make sure that that description is, is in here somewhere. So... So in looking at this document as, as a whole, um, I think compared to our original one, which was really Nuisance House, and it the Nuisance House focused very much on um, partying, and it was either you know a party house or, or not, and it, it really didn't have any way to, to cover some of the issues, some of the many issues that were raised by neighbors, including, you know, parking, in the front lawn and trash and and lack of maintenance of the of the home and the and the yard and that kind of thing, and so this I think hopefully discover uh, describes nuisances more fully. Um, one of the things in sort of analyzing this bylaw is that um, it tries to have a tiered approach. So there's you know a, a property that has no you know has has a, a, a violation or two, then there's a property that actually has met the criteria of being a, new, uh, a problem property where they have accrued several violations within a period of time. And then finally, the description of a nuisance property, which um, is sort of the, the, the telling point, the, the tipping point. Um, this approach also tries to identify who is notified at what level, um, because not everybody has to be uh, notified the first violation or two. It, it tries to simplify and clarify who needs to get engaged. I think one of the things we heard from many of the property managers is that they felt they were not responsible for tenant behavior. 
And in fact, they aren't really for the first couple of violations, but once something may be deemed a, a problem property, then they're at least notified and they're asked to step in to help rectify the situation. Um, this bylaw also now includes sort of a notification prop, uh, process. If something becomes a problem property, if it becomes a nuisance property, and how to correct those issues. And then finally, just what are our enforcement procedures? Um, so if this is legible and if you, you can see it well enough, you also have the ability to print it out on your own or bring it up on your own screen. But as Mandy has often done, um, I thought we could just start at the beginning and go through and um, go through section by section. Again, I, I want to make sure that we're done this by, let's see, about um, a quarter of six. Okay, so if we can keep an eye on that. Um, under the definitions, um, something that was highlighted was um, that the costs associated with the, the enforcement, the responses, under number five, um, that that the schedule of cost would be established by the town manager. And I didn't remember, you know, that that could be the, that could be the inspection department um, as as the designee of the town manager. But I didn't remember that conversation at all. Did anybody else have any thoughts about that? Pam Bear one attendee. Oh, thank you. Any thoughts on, on who might establish the Jan uh, Jennifer? I don't have a thought. I'm just wondering why town manager is, it, it, does he have a role to play in that now? I don't know. Does John know that answer? I don't know the answer to that. That, that somehow someone has set some response cost to. Oh. Um, That's how it is right now. And if you look at the, what it, the law is right, like the bylaw as it stands currently, I think that statement is the response the cost is sort of Right, the, it's the same, right. Yeah. So then he can assign it to whoever he chooses to set um, the cost. Where is it? Then? Yeah. Then I'm going to, I'm, for now, Staff I'm just going to. Okay. Well, there should be one if that's there and it is in the bylaw as it stands right now. There should be a schedule of costs. And that would have to be reviewed periodically as things change, I guess, price. I don't know. John, are you aware of any schedule of costs? Or no. is it the standard, the standard, you know, um, violation violation fee or whatever of hundred dollars a day? I mean, the general bylaw lays out typically what those. Um, it doesn't. Well, like for a noise violation or a nuisance house thing, it says three hundred dollars right in the bylaw. Yeah, but that's different than a response cost. What if there's damage done or the cost of the staff? I, I that's what I thought. We don't being... have. I don't think we have anything like that. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so I don't know. I'd be good to clarify, perhaps with Paul, what because a re, a violation, a ticket, a violation is not a response cost. No, I think this is. Um... This is sort of addresses like that property on, uh, was it uh, 20 Allen that we went to? So we had fire there. We had the police there. We had, um, you know, the building inspection office. We had a, an electrical inspector there. The, you know, an assistant uh, district attorney was there. I mean, if you started to add that all up for how, what did it cost us to be there for an hour? Mm-hmm pretty serious yeah 
And I think that's what this is addressing, whether it's ever been used or not, I don't know. No, I think it's new language, but it's not a bad idea. Okay. Well, it is in the current bylaw, so it's not too new. I wonder if there was a response, uh, if the property owner received, you know, incurred the cost for those responses. Yeah, we, it'd be interesting to find out. Good. So we've noted it. And we'll come back to that the, the next round. Um, under B, the public nuisance violation. So this is the list, Shalini, of of all of the nuisances that I guess that we we could think of. <laughs> um, uh, a violation of the bylaw to create, host, allow, attend, or engage in a public nuisance. Um, and I, this this note in yellow is simply that we wanted to keep track of the fact that. Um, that if there were multiple violations, that they would, in fact, at some at some level, trigger um, a, a problem property and then a nuisance property designation. And I think that that comment can come away because I think we have covered this. I'm going to just exit out. Any other, Jennifer? You have your hand up. Yeah, I don't know if this is the time to ask it, but it was a question I had for John. Um, I don't know if you're immediately familiar with like 219, and I think it's 227 East Pleasant Street. There, It's a yellow house and a white house, different owners next door to each other, um, just north of Triangle. I know that. Yeah. yeah. So um, would they fall under... Um, I guess it's one or two. So there's both been behavioral issues with alcohol and then, you know, trash and all. It's a visual and um, behavioral nuisance. Yeah, and there's I don't, a lot of um, parking issues at those properties as well. So would they be, would that, in terms of the um, property owner being responsible, would, would that come under our rental bylaw as well as the nuisance bylaw? I mean, would that be caught in one or both of these? Because those houses have been problems for years. What's the address again, uh, Jennifer? 219. 19 and two, I believe it's 227. Thank you. Agnes Ting owns one of them and um, a fellow from out of town owns the other one. And if you drive by them now, they don't look great, but they're not, once they're occupied, they're, they're, they're not in violation right now, but, but um, yeah, the kids are not there. Yeah. So, so I think to, to Jennifer's question though, if we go through this bylaw, are we going to be able to rectify those situations more easily because of this, with this bylaw? I guess um, the question is, when does it become a public nuisance? Um, you know, how, is it how much time we're spending on it? Is it how many complaints it, it incurs? Um, there's there's a there's a neighbor who's an active complainer, um, and that's but but also these are on a main public way, so you know we drive by and we we see it. Okay, so um, Jennifer, does that do you want to follow up? Just wondering. So, so the neighbor complains. Like I know one complaint was they had they were giving alcohol, and it was like drive by and beep, and they come out and give you alcohol. That was one disturbance, and then just there's always debris. So the the neighbor makes a complaint, and let's say there's four complaints. Then what happens with under this? Yeah, I I don't know the answer to that. What does happen under this? What what's the trigger for becoming a public nuisance? I I can tell you what the the document says, and that's that if there are if there are three or more 
violations within a lease period, they're at least acknowledged as a problem property and the owner gets notified and they are responsible for creating a correction plan. If there's a if there's a follow-up violation within a short period of time after the initial violation, then they become quickly become a nuisance violation, a uh, nuisance property. But we'll, we we'll get to that in a little bit. But Jennifer, I actually thought that um, to have a correction plan was a really I think that's a great idea because it involves the property owner in a way that you're not monetarily, it's like we're going to work together here to do to do that. So I think I like that. And it's hard to imagine a property owner wouldn't want to join one in doing that. You know, it's being like, let's have come up with a solution rather before we're going to be punitive. Uh, this, this number two, B2, is that description that we talked about, um, public nuisance, I mean, uh, peaceful enjoyment, or in this case, the quiet enjoyment of private or pu public property. Does anybody want to change that to the peaceful enjoyment? Melanie? Yeah, I just looked up the definition, and I think this is better. It's very simple change. It is, um, hold on. Uh, uh, Public nuisance consists of acts that interfere with the enjoyment of a person's property. So it's not, it just removes the word quiet basically, but so anything that interferes with the enjoyment of a person's property. I mean, I'm happy to see, but I think that broadens it beyond quiet. And then we also list out the specifics of what is included within enjoyment. Uh, the way this reads, it says um, substantial disturbance of the, let's say, the, the enjoyment of private or public property to a significant segment of a neighborhood. And I wasn't sure where that wording came from. Who who gets to determine how significant right. a portion of a neighborhood it is? Um, so we, because it feels odd, I, uh, Pam, I think you're on it. Uh, if it's bothering one person who's right next door, but it doesn't bother somebody three houses down, what does that mean? Or four houses down? Does it mean that we that we throw a, a you know a radius around that property, and you know if it disturbs, you know it gets it it just gets so prescriptive if we say well fifty percent of the people within you know, of the uh, the abutters or something like that, um, that gets harder and harder to, <laughs> like John, to have to track. <laughs> um, John won't have to do it anymore very soon. <laughs> we used to, when Beth and I lived up on Montague Road, um, you would sit out on the porch and it, it would sound like the UMass drum line was out in the driveway. I mean, um, you know, what kind of a radius is that? That's that's a, that's a couple miles away. Right. You can't. Uh. So we cite them, cite them for public nuisance. <laughs> Jennifer. No, I, I would just say it, it should just be if it's if your enjoyment of a public or private property, period. I mean, if if your neighbor has to is disturbed every weekend, that's mm -hmm. a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was thinking if um, um, you talk about a butter notices, and I think that's everything within two hundred feet or whatever. So I I, I think yeah, that yeah. I think that's fine. Just it, it'll be. It'll be up to someone. It's also some neighborhoods, the houses are closer together than others. Right. 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 Okay. So that's kind of, that's what, what is being considered a public nuisance violation. So let's see if there are any below. This yellow right here, certain violations that lists 
um, all of the other references to uh, violations that we track and they come from all the different zoning bylaw sections um, and they are valid. I checked them all, they, they make sense, but they refer to uh, excess outdoor lighting, occupancy of the household, vegetation maintenance and parking. Colony. Who is this bylaw meant to be read by? Residents, right? Like if I was new in town and I wanted to look at it. So this to me means like I need to go into each and every of those bylaws. I don't think I'm going to do that. Like it says, you know, go to 11.2417 or 12 this is. And I wonder if there's like an appendix attached to this, which gives a description. Like if we don't want to make this too lengthy or something, but it just seems too onerous for people to go and find those different things. Um, so if we listed the categories then, so this is B2, um, A1 and 2, if we listed the categories and then had an appendix of mm -hmm. the actual, you know, that's a good idea. Yep. Yeah. Clean it up a little bit and simplify it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm moving on to page 2. So other activities that may not violate a specific bylaw but that we talked about that disturb, again, the quiet enjoyment of a property. Actually, the sidewalk obstruction is a violation of a bylaw. Um, yeah, yeah. And so is vegetation. Uh, yeah, now it is. Grass and right. weeds. If it impacts the use of the sidewalk, if it impacts the public way, my neighbors next door do not uh, mow their lawn. And it's, you know, you know, it's a, but that's their property. They have a right to do that. But if it impacts the street, the public street, and there's, I asked them to mow one section because it blocked um, vision down the road when you were pulling out. So that is already taken care. Okay, so and, we'll note that it is a violation now. It should go with that other category. Well, except those are zoning. This is general bylaws. So either that, so either it has to say general bylaws here or it has to go in here, certain violations of the zoning or general bylaws, and then they would need to be listed. Okay, so this does that make sense? Of the general this to be general, general bylaw or zoning bylaw. Yeah, and if um you have a three in general, but what what is that we all worked on that very recently? Um, snow and ice. It's three point right. four zero, maybe. Yeah, that sounds yeah. right. So, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um. So, what I sometimes see in my, you know, is because there's single car driveways and if there's four cars with the house that sometimes a car is always parked over the sidewalk on the driveway would that come under the snow and ice and general obstruction by law if it stops pedestrians from being able to walk without yes. going into the street yes okay i mean john correct me if i'm wrong on that uh yeah but the more powerful um tool is in the zoning that says you can park two cars in the front setback. So the front setback starts at the property line. You've already then got more than two cars in that. That's that's what we've been citing up, up mm -hmm. to now. Not that you're blocking the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Okay. You get them two ways. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Um, so the rest of this list was vegetation, overgrowth of grass and weeds, indoor furniture on the front lawn, and then again, sort of a list of um, things that that are noted by the inspection services or the police, which is regulations relating to animals, false alarms, junk vehicles, unlawful noise, littering, and illegal dumping, snow and ice. Oh, there we are. There's snow and ice. Um, disorderly conduct, possession of alcohol, and 
and and that's it. Yeah, in general, bylaw 3.4 doesn't have to be corrected now, but we should note it is not snow and ice anymore. Oh, and snow okay. and ice is still in the title, I believe, but I forget what the whole hoji is. Yeah, it's been because we just rescinded and replaced it. Yeah. Shalane has got her hand up. Yeah. Shalane, thank you. Yeah. Um... Pa uh, patches brought up about the neighbor with the you know vegetation overgrowth of grass and weeds so just generally some people that have longer grass um is that applying to them or only if it obstructs vision or safety or something because some people been. like longer right and they should be allowed to have it that's why i'm yeah. saying you know, yeah to them was where it was blocking vision to exit the street Right, but right now it just says it's very general, general, broad vegetation overgrowth of grass and weeds. And that's yeah, I don't want to regulate personal taste about creating yeah. a meadow. Exactly. Walking, it's walking sidewalk. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and so again, we, we sort of list the same types of things where it just reminds everyone that these are general categories of, of issues that we that we bump into. Any 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 additions there? Can I go on? Um this is the sh very short definition of a problem property designation or a nuisance property. Uh, it says upon a third violation of this bylaw ensuing with any one year period or the current lease period, because most of those are what from June to June kind of a thing. Uh, or at the discretion of the enforcing authority, the property shall be designated a problem property. So that would be John weighing in or his department weighing in. Where, and then we'll talk about how each of the, these is dealt with, but where um, where it ratchets up is then a nuisance property. And, and we really need to have a discussion about what categorizes, what triggers that nuisance property. So if you've got three violations in a in a school year, let's say, um, along with that third violation, you are a problem property. Upon any additional by, violation of this bylaw within the same one year or current lease period, after they've already been noted as a problem property, in other words, it would be their fourth or more violation or if they failed to implement a corrective plan and that's at the designation of the of the inspection staff then the property would be designated a nuisance property does that make sense Jennifer it does I just I have a question I should probably know this but in the past or, or currently, because we haven't adopted this, if there's a problem property, um, John, your office would get, so there, we haven't done a corrective plan. So I just want to be clear that the building and department would initiate the corrective plan. So I'm trying, what I'm trying to think of this, Pam, I know that you reached out, you wrote to a landlord outside of Amherst who had a problem property and you had a constituent who was complaining and you never heard back. If the town were to send a letter, John, would you probably hear back? Uh, maybe not. I'm, I've got one that I'm chasing right now and I've heard zero from the owner. Uh, Pam, you know the property, it's on Taylor Street. Yep, yep. What do you, so what does the town do then? I mean, just, at some point suspend the license the next time uh, the the permit when it comes up for renewal i mean what 
I mean, I don't know what the next step is. And this, this maybe gives you some guidance about this. As far as I'm concerned, this property would already be a problem property. And it's probably already then kicked up to a nuisance property because I've gotten no, no response. So would we um, not allow that uh, property owner to renew their permit the next time? I mean, is that the only thing that's going to maybe, you know, get through to them? We're all waiting for time to go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how you're going to enforce that. Uh, that but I, well, I, they would have to apply for a permit. And if they're denied that, they'll know that, right? Right. So let's, let's keep going through this and see if it, see if it makes sense. Cause that's exactly, I think why we felt that a nuisance property bylaw needed to be strengthened so that it gave the inspection services something to stand on. Um, and I'm surprised to learn they don't even respond to the town. That's interesting. Yeah, go on. I'm sorry. Yeah. So so after you have a designation, you're either, you know, a great property or you're a problem property or you become a nuisance property. It, it, the next section is, okay, so who's, who's responsible? Who do you contact? And for properties that haven't been designated anything yet, but have had a couple violations, um, you basically go to the occupants, um, the occupants at the property where the where the nuisance is occurring, and it could be the occupants, it could be the the people who ever organized or sponsored an activity that ended up as a nuisance, um, or people that are engaging the in the activity. So it's the partying, it's the invitations to a party um, that I would say are typically what would would fall in here. Um, once a property is designated as a problem property, so if they've had three violations in within this period of time, um, if if it is a problem property, then who gets notified? So it would be the same occupants. It would be the same whoever sponsored the activity. It'd be the same people engaged in the activity. And then it would be any owner or persons in charge of the problem property who have not met with town officials and submitted a corrective action plan within seven days. So you, so you finally bring in as a problem property, you say, okay, you're going to engage the owner with, with the, with, I'll say the charges. Um, designation and the and the notification that they have a problem property on their hands. That makes sense. Jennifer. Yes, and I'm wondering if we could have here that if the property owner doesn't respond to communication from the town that there's some consequence. I mean I, you know, when you mentioned your instance where you had written to the property owner a handwritten mailed letter and you didn't respond. I was like, okay, you're just you. But I assumed if they got it from our building commissioner, there'd be a response. But to hear that they will actually ignore the building commissioner, then there, there really needs to be some consequence, I think. Because it seems like giving the opportunity for corrective action plan is you know, goodwill on the part of the town. So they're, if they're not responding to notification from the town or an invitation to develop a corrective action plan, then it seems like all we have then is to deny them the uh, opportunity to renew a, a permit for the next year. Any other thoughts on that? Pat or Shalini? Um, okay, so if so, back to back to here. If um, if a property is designated a problem property, it would engage the owners and or the or the 
property managers, the people, the persons in charge. Um, uh, if a property then then is designated a nuisance property, which means there has been yet another violation or more on that same property, um, the the same occupants are responsible. The same person sponsoring the activity are responsible. Are responsible. The people engaging in the activity are responsible. The owners and the persons in charge um, have now been notified. They're also have been notified now that they were not just a problem property, but now they're a nuisance property. Um, and that the, the public nuisance violation had occurred 14, you know, two weeks, say, after notification to the owner of that problem property. So it's a problem property, John sends a note to the people and two weeks later, nothing has been done. Um, they could be notified that they are now a nuisance property. So I'm um, curious about how I hold the occupants responsible. How do I know who the occupants are? Don't you have on file the occupants with every lease? No, I don't have the leases. I have to request the leases. Uh, there's no way we could manage, you know, what what are we talking about here? 5,000 leases that are going to come in every year and we're going <laughs> to... No, we don't have that. We don't, we don't keep that information. John, then going back, whether it's a problem or a nuisance property, how do you, how do you... Uh, cite the occupants or the. Uh, I don't cite the occupants. Mm -hmm. I don't cite occupants. Who do you cite? The owner. Even even on a first pass, there's a drinking party at. That's know, a police a thing. Police. That's. Hmm. So wouldn't you have the right, just like police has, if it's in the bylaw that we allow you to do that? If there's a violation, you can knock on the door and find people or give them a notice. I can't. I can't just hand out tickets to anybody. No, I, I, I don't have those sort of police powers. Even if it was written in the bylaw that the inspection people can go and. I don't know. I guess that needs to be run by the town attorney. Mm. So the the in this case, letter uh, number three A, B, and C are the same people that we thought we were acknowledging. You know, with a minor violation, the first violation, the second violation, who who gets who gets the ticket? And and those are to me, those are probably more the the noise and party type activities that would occur. The, uh, the police ticket, you know, um, the occupants. If there's a noise complaint for a loud party or whatever, they they go there, they identify the occupants and they write tickets to them and then they take them to court. Okay. And that could also be the, 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 the folks who maybe organize the activity and also if there are unruly folks, it's the people who are participating in the activity. That's right. So that's typically police driven. That's right. Um, let's say we get into the, sorry, Jennifer, you want to break in? I have a question after. Okay. So, so let's say then um, we've now gone into other categories of violation that have started to add up. Um, you do have the owner's um, contact information because that's required in our rental registration bylaw. Um, you can you can demand the lease. Yes. Um, so all of that could have happened in your first in your first correspondence to the to the owner and or project um, person. That's right. And you and you say. Your house, your house has, you know, has hit the threshold for a problem property. I am notifying you of that, and I'm and I'm directing you to provide us a corrective action plan 
within X number of days. Does does that does that work? Does this give you the authority to do that? It does. I don't. It works with most people. Jennifer. It sounds like this is where the disconnect is. The neighbors call the police. The police deal with that response to the noise or nuisance complaint, and it doesn't get communicated to the building commissioner's office or inspections. Is that correct? There's a record keeping thing that needs to happen here. Yes. Right. There needs to be some. So this is what happened with a house around the corner, you know, or a house in my district, a, a, a major nuisance house and the calls. So I, you know, was contacted by the constituents and I involved the management company, but the calls would go into the police station. And it just so happened there were like six calls that went in over the three days of graduation weekend. And a new property manager with the company assigned to that property happened on her own to look at the police call for the weekend and saw that there were like six calls to one of the houses that she manages. But if she hadn't taken that initiative, built inspections wouldn't know it and she hadn't known it. She oh, we know it. Those calls, those weekend calls are shared with all the landlords okay. and inspection services. So she saw it by reading that email from Bill Laramie. Oh, okay. Because she said she. Oh, okay. I always wanted to wonder that. She so she didn't on her own look at the log. It was sent to her. That's right. Okay, so that's great. So that connection was made. So Just she saw her an address for a property that she right. managed, and she said, "Whoa, uh oh." And this was a, actually a very nice story because. Back in June, she reached out to me and the neighbors. We met with her. And just today, I got an email from her saying, I would like to you all to come to a meeting. She had a date and time. She had worked it out with the eight new tenants of this house, because it's a two unit, to meet. And she did that on her own. So anyway. That's how it should work. Right. So that's a happy ending, hopefully. But it's good to know that that connection, the calls came to the police and it did get where it needed to go. Okay. Thank you. So but sometimes sometimes what happens is the police get those calls, they're too busy to respond. They by the time they do respond, there's no noise there. You'll see that in the police log. A noise gone on arrival. Noise gone on arrival. That doesn't mean there wasn't a problem there. It just that didn't happen here, but yeah. When they but got there, ask, yeah. But would they have so they notified the property owner, but would they have also notified you? In, no. In, in, no. I mean, I get those emails, but no, there's no, there's no other uh, sort of mechanical connection there that, you know, we would, we would see that or it would be tagged to that property. Should that happen? Mm. I mean, if you're going to start keeping score, then it has to happen, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it does. Jennifer, that's a good point. I was going to ask, um, I remember in the recent conversation about um, streetlights that one of the new additions to that bylaw was that there would be a um, a public listing. Actually, I think it might have been a map, but at least a public listing of of all of the streetlights in town and when they were changed. And I was going to ask that we insert some language here that that makes and keeps a public record of all violations um, such that somebody, whether it's, you know, a, a, a potential tenant, uh, somebody who wants to, go, you know, move into that house, they could actually look to see what the records were for that property. Um, I know that the link to the, the GIS map has been broken for a long time, but- It's not broken. It's just that there was, there's a security risk with that program and so they shut that off but yes that's how that used to happen all those noise complaints and all of my violations and complaints got got tagged onto properties and you could go to that map and you could see any house in town that had them you could click on it you could bring up the list um but we we we've lost that functionality now that program's no longer supported right right so the question is how do we I think we need to add some wording in here that requires a listing of all violations charged or whatever, so that they're noted 
um, publicly. And I think that was something that we heard pretty loud and clear from from a lot of the neighbors who who had originally encouraged the town to keep the map link up. Um, so I, I'll think about some some something like you know the town will track um, nuisance violations and problem properties um, on a town website. Let's see, what did I jot down? Um, in an accessible location and format, mapped if possible. Jennifer. So if um, Bill Laramie is keeping a, a record of noise, of complaints to the police department on some weekly or monthly basis, can that be sent to inspections? So you can see property, you know, so that- It is, it is sent, it's sent to me. Okay, and who, who will it be sent to in two weeks? Rob? Yeah, I guess Rob, <laughs> I don't know. Well, and I would say what, what happens if, you know, A, if Bill Laramie goes on vacation or they decide not to continue that position, what happens to that, you know, assessment and, <laughs> and list? Yeah, change happens. I know, I know. So we need to sort of build in, I think, that there's some reporting on this. I think that was what was going through my head anyway. Um, should, that be, should that be in this bylaw, though? Feels like it should. Maybe under enforcement. How about we just put it in here for now? Um, To help us remember. Is that okay? Um, so back to the back to the and sorry, this is really tedious, isn't it? <laughs> it's such a horrible process. Um, but so I, I just want to kind of recap for my own self. Um, so this is what happens when a property becomes a, a problem property. The occupants are addressed, served a citation from the police or whatever, but the owners the owners um, need to submit or provide a, a corrective action plan within seven days of being notified that they have a problem. Does, does that make sense? Does that work? Yes, that's good. Okay. When they ratchet up to becoming a nuisance property, it's essentially the same thing. The owners or persons in charge have been notified that it's a, a, a nuisance property and that there has been another violation. Actually, um, I think they would be notified that the property was a was identified as a problem property and another nuisance occurs within or after 14 days of I think that's so oh, I'm sorry. I think, I think that's a mistake. Um the owner of the property should not be held responsible for a violation if the owner is actively trying to evict a tenant from the property. And this to me gets really sticky. If there was if there was additional violation occurring and and you would would the owner just say, Oh, I'm trying to evict them, it's the it's the middle of the second semester and um I'm going to be evicting these people. I'm starting the process now. Would they just use that as an excuse to not take corrective action in the meantime? I'm looking at John. Um, uh, depends on what the correction 
the corrective action is, I mean, I think you got uh, probably parallel tracks here, you know, um, they, they probably still need to correct whatever it is and they might be evicting the problems, but that's, that's only part of the solution. So describe what that, what that actually means then. I don't, we don't get involved in an eviction. That's, that's something, you know, that a, a property owner or landlord does in housing court. Um, I, I think it depends on what, what it was, what was, what were the issues that brought this to, to become a nuisance property? It, it had to been pretty egregious to go from being just a problem property that you were going to take corrective action on and give me, show me what the plan was to now you've leaped up to this. Um, yeah, something, something broke down here. Yeah, so so the question is, do we do we keep the sentence in here then that the owner would not be responsible if they are in fact in the middle of a um, if they're in the middle of a um, eviction process? I'm trying to imagine how it is that the owner isn't responsible for anything that happened up to the point where we got all the way to here. Mm -hmm. They can't be that disengaged with the property. So does it make sense to just take this out, this reference to evictions out? Let's see here. Provided the owner has been notified. You've been notified it's a problem property. And another nuisance. Occurred. Another nuisance has occurred within 14 days after you knew that this was a problem. Yeah, they're not going to have gotten an eviction process going in those 14 days. Yeah. Um, I hear what John is saying about it's not going to happen in 14 days, but if an owner of the property is trying to evict a tenant or tenants from their property already for these kinds of violations or non-payment of rent or what other reasons, um, why should, yeah, it just seems... I'm I'm questioning whether they should be responsible because one of the things that might happen is that the tenants decide to do a blowout party because they're leaving or I don't know it I I'm not sure how it I does happen. That. Yes, I hear what you're saying. And I think what this means is if you've got if you've all this has happened and you're now in this active process of trying to get them out, I'm not going to cite you for a, another thing. Mhm. Mm I mean, yeah, if you're not doing anything, of course you should be cited again. But if you're actually actively trying to correct the uh, situation by evicting tenants. Right. I'm not writing you more fines. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes sense to maybe keep that in there. It does. Yep. Okay. I mean, how many evictions occur in a year for misbehavior uh few very few yeah. if any yeah, good question Pat. <laughs> okay so we'll 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 um i'm going to also take out the question that that was prompted so we'll just do that okay good okay enforcement this is a, just a simple list of the tools that um, are available. One is monetary penalty. Um, two is abatement. Um, and I guess that means corrected, right? Um, should we use the word corrected or is abate the real word? Shalini, you've got your hand up. Sorry. Yeah. Did we discuss the E, part E of the previous section, the designation 
oh. of the property may result in the suspension of their permit. So that to me felt a little ambiguous. It's kind of for a property owner to not know, like under, like we need to, I, firstly, I'm not sure I agree that we should be penalizing, but we've sort of had this discussion and it sounds like what I'm hearing John say that they cannot be completely disconnected from what's happening with the renters. So they are to some degree responsible I get that, but then to just leave this over there, hey, could your thing could be suspended, but without specifying if so many, um, I don't know what those criteria will be under which I think we need to specify that. So Shalini, if if we if we have a situation where um, the inspection department says, well, there there are all these violations, the neighbors. The neighbors, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about the folks in in North Amherst that we um, are talking about um, a duplex being built on a property that already has pages of violations attributed mm -hmm. to existing property. At what point does the town have any um, have any say in in the ability for these people to continue to make money? Mm -hmm. um, property. Yeah, I think that, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, just, I think it's very important um, that a permit be, the potential for a suspension of the a permit is there. Mm -hmm. I think it's it, not having that there, then the landlord doesn't, isn't really responsible for anything or, mm -hmm. you know, the impact is minimal. Um. And it is May, mm -hmm. so it still would be up to the uh, inspection services about, you know. But I just mean, even for the inspection services, would they want a little more clarity around when? Because it just may not happen or it may, you know, it's just kind of very ambiguous to me. Like, I completely agree that if there are all these things piling up and then they should be a threshold at which point this gets triggered, but should we specify? I mean, I would probably want to hear from John because you have the most practical experience with what this might look like. Or since when you're gone, let's say they're lesser experienced people who come in your place now, what would give them that um, the freedom or the, uh, what's it, the authority to, to go there? What needs to happen for that person, for the st down staff inspection to trigger uh, this thing, revocation of the permit? I think, yeah, I I hear what you're asking, and mm -hmm. I um, I think you'd have to been totally ignored i mean you have exhausted every other form right. of, of your authority here you've been to court mm -hmm. the magistrate has said you got to do this by august 1st august 1st comes and goes no action um okay now we're now we're going to take away your rental permit i'm i wonder if they will recognize that authority um i, I don't know how you get them to not rent their house but um it's a it seems like it's a an inevitability that you're gonna have to do it so yeah if they continue to rent the house there are fines that would could that be imposed on them the fines and the fines go, you know, you end up back in court. Um, yeah. Right. And they come to court and they say, oh, man, I, you know, I can't pay fifty seven hundred dollars. I don't have that kind of money. Um, and it gets it gets um, negotiated, you know. Yeah. So it, um, so just to sort of sum, <clears throat> sorry to sum up this this section E. So something has been designated a nuisance. 
Um, it has climbed the ladder to the point where a corrective action plan was originally required for a problem property. They have not done that in a timely manner. They haven't, they, you know, they've sort of ignored the, the directives of the town to, to abate the problem. Um, if we didn't have section E in there that says it, this could, you know, violation of this or, 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 um, designation as a nuisance property can result in you not being able to fence this property. It, it does feel like Pat said, it does feel like it's kind of the only teeth we have. Yeah. In, mm -hmm. It makes sense, and we have it in the current bylaw. Right. Okay, only thing is I am convinced we should have it. Uh, do we just need to qualify it by saying something like if all other measures or something, if they have, if all measures have, or like what you were saying, John, if all other... Uh, if all other attempts at compliance fail, bang. Yes, thank you, yes. I like that. And of course, all of this has to be checked by because would that be hard to prove in a court and all of that? So we'll get the right legal language perhaps, but okay, thank you. That sounds good. <clears throat> okay, so then enforcement is, um, and it's now about 10, it's about five, 535, so a couple, you know, 10 more minutes of this and then we'll switch. Um, enforcement is monetary penalty, abatement, meaning fix it, um, response costs, those are something the town can levy, a corrective action plan may be requested, a loss of a rental permit, so again, this is one tool we have, and then um, this is where I threw in that, that tracking the list of violations on, on some public website so that the community is aware of, it feels kind of like enforcement to me, um, that the, the community why? is aware of. Why but, is it enforcement? I don't I'm, know. It, I, may I, I, be, no. it, it may not be appropriate here, but it's it's like having this public knowledge is, is a tool. Public um, humiliation is a tool. Yeah, so we're stocks. And... <laughs> Public whippings. Yeah, we, why do we do away with those, actually? <laughs> oh, John, John. <laughs> You're so full of it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> what about a dunking stool? Come on. <laughs> so, the question is does, does this belong here? Right. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Um, so again, it doesn't, it doesn't dictate any of these, it's just listing out what, what enforcement. <laughs> um, I tell you where you don't want to live next door to. Yeah, right, right. Um, yeah, but how many people would go on a town website to see if they Actually, the off-campus um, student housing used to use that as a tool. They would oh. pull the map up, they would ask prospective tenants where they were thinking of living, they would say an address, they would pull it up and say, well, you know, maybe you want to um, think twice about that. This house has actually been a problem house. Or maybe they're saying, boy, the neighbors on that block are really strict. You don't want to live there. <laughs> um, this this next section, which is, which is um, Let's see, it's called notification and correction process. So this is sort of these are the steps that happen. This is this is the corrective action that's requested. And um uh and I'm looking at my watch going, do we want to delve into this or not? And maybe we we just sort of run through it and then we can think about it for the next round. But in public property notification, so if something has achieved the status of public of problem property, a notice of that will be mailed to the owners and the persons in charge, telling them that the property has been designated a problem property, 
Um, if a residential permit exists for the property, the permit may be suspended, revoked, or denied renewal. That may be needs to go down into the nuisance property section. It, that seems like a little bit tough on this first go around your problem property. I don't know if it's appropriate to, to make that statement. Um, and then each day or portion thereof that the violation exists beyond the corrective action plan time frame will constitute a separate offense. So this is John's department going, you know, you have three weeks to get this thing mm -hmm. fixed. Um, and if not, you start accruing fines. Um, if more than one provision of this bylaw is violated, each provision violated is, constitutes a separate offense. So the process for public for problem property correction is upon notification of the problem designation, um, the owner or manager will contact the town and schedule a meeting within seven days. So they've given them notified they have a week to reach out and schedule a meeting. Doesn't mean that the meeting has to happen within the seven days, but at least they have scheduled the meeting and to discuss the property and initiate the development of a corrective action plan to address the issues. A written corrective action plan will be submitted to the town within 10 calendar days after receipt of the problem property designation. So it gives them a week and a half to actually submit a plan in writing to fix things. Um, can you all read that? Uh, and then the town will direct implementation of the plan and identify the time frame for getting it fixed. Failure to submit the action plan by the deadline is considered a separate violation. Failure to implement the plan results then and there in a nuisance property designation for the property. Does that make sense? Jennifer. I mean, I think so. I said it before because it doesn't hold the property owner responsible for the tenant's behavior, but it involves them in a corrective plan. And I think for most property owners, not the ones who, well, hopefully, but the ones that don't even respond when they hear from the building commissioner's office, but I think for most, they would then be, you know, um, following that property. And this is not something that they're, they're not going to want to have to be doing corrective action plans every month. So I think it involves them. And I think most will then be proactive and, and hopefully it will involve those that don't respond right now. But I, I don't know. I think this is very good. Any other, any other thoughts on this? Cause I think this is where we should probably hold up with it. And I'll just put a, mm symbol or something that we stop here. <laughs> stop here, 8-17-23. Okay. Um, so the similar, similar to that, though, the nuisance property, what is the, what is the time frame? I would love John's feedback on the nuisance property because um, I think there is a question of do you go through the whole corrective action plan again and give them another 10 days to do another plan and then you know give them a time frame for getting it abated or is there somehow somewhere a more immediate feedback to them and that's John, you want to just... I, I think it has to be uh, an immediate feedback. You know, the, you've we've we've negotiated a time frame here, and for some reason it hasn't happened. Um, I can only think that it hasn't happened because you weren't driving. You know, um, I, I do work with landlords who you know I can't get I can't get Minuteman Pest to come until next Thursday. Okay, you know. But you're we're in communication. There's there's 
we're communicating with each other. That's fine. It's I don't want to go back there in 15 days and find out you didn't do anything. Yeah. So so the response from you is that yes, we need some immediate feedback rather than another, like I'll just say another series of of compliance plans. No, I mean, you know, right. We had a plan and you didn't stick to it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, John, thank you. And I would I would love your remaining. When, when do you retire? Tomorrow. August. No, September 1st is my last day. But you're not counting. <laughs> so it's, it's within two weeks and we will That's, not have your CRC. Right. Within won't two be, weeks. I won't be, this was my last meeting. John, will you read this carefully and 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 make some comments because I really value your contribution to this. I will. Blasted yeah. document. Thank you. And and before you sign off, mm -hmm. the topic. Um, and everybody is going to join me in this, but really, really appreciate it and really enjoy working with you. Good. <laughs> I you know, can I say something? You bet. <laughs> um. Yeah, no, John. So I was on Fearing Street at a little gathering a few weeks ago, and they're a tough crowd on Fearing Street. Yeah. Was, they usually uh, have uh, pitchforks and torches. Yes, but <laughs> the person, they were singing your praises. I mean, they really feel like they have a friend. Yes. <laughs> at Paul, and you are, I mean, we just can't thank you enough. You are unbelievably responsive, you know, for years before I was on the council, I literally had John's, I would text him <laughs> as I was walking my dog and would see things. And you, you're you just, and you, I think you started the conversations, the meetings on the street in front of a rental house between the neighbors and the students. And wow. it's really been life altering. So just thank you for so much. You've um, I, really mm. been a gift to the town. We're, you're going to be missed. <laughs> you. Happy retirement. Thank yeah, you. happy retirement. <laughs> Thank you so much, John, for everything you've done and the way you've done at your disposition, everything. Just Thank you. Yeah, we really deeply appreciate you and your humor, mm -hmm. your intelligence, <laughs> and, and the work you've been doing for years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Travel well. All right, sign yeah, up. Yeah, enjoy. Bye-bye. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. all for now. Mm -hmm. That's a deep sadness to That's lose. That's so sad. Yeah, yeah, it's it's John and oh, I know. Uh... I know. So Sonia, then Sean. You know the well, Sonia. I could handle because right. we have Sean, yeah. and we're an incredible team. But to lose, mm -hmm. you know, and she was a loss for me because we were friends as well. And mm -hmm. but Sean being driven out is just horrible. Was and he driven I, out? Did he? Did he feel? Beleaguered? Yes, he was driven out by um, the way he had been treating it, treated in meetings by some of the public. Ooh. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, it is. I, I did not know that. Yeah. <clears throat> because he is the I think that might be a bomb under pressure. Yeah. That might be a topic for another. Right. Or the TSO or some, I don't know if it's even something, but it does. Yeah. This has happened before. Right. So and now we have this new law where we can't even. And there's the difference. Fire civility. That's about public comment. It's, uh, and yes, people can say anything they want. And well, this wasn't necessarily but, public comment related. No, this was a, a lot of it was public comment. And distortions and that personal Who attacks. Needs Who needs it? Right. And yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, that's really disappointing. I, I, when I wrote to him, I just said, you know, you, you were so, you shouldered so many different responsibilities. I hope you know, it was sort of maybe at his cho at his choosing or maybe at the request of the town manager to take on things. And I said, I hope that's not- It I wasn't the workload, it was people. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah. 
we have a lot to answer for as a community and I don't know whether we will answer it or even ask the questions that need to get asked about it. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks for bringing that up, Pat, but that's definitely a conversation to be yeah. had. Uh, for now, do you want to do a public comment if anyone? Yeah. Public comment before we switch into the the um so Renata, you are the you're one not one. supposed to say the names okay. and I do that. That's why I'm <laughs> the, planning department, the planning department reads the names of everyone who attends. I think it's a great idea. And because if they were sitting in the audience, they would look around, they'd see each other, they would know who was there. And in this case, it's Renata who is all by herself in the in the audience. And um, I would like to let her know that it's that, that we're open for public comment. If she would like to raise her hand, I will do my best to try to bring her in. Yay, she did say she wanted to speak. Yeah. Hi, Renata. Do you, uh, can you unmute yourself and give us your name and address? Hi, thank you, Renata Shepard, uh, Justice Drive in Amherst. Um, I, looking at the, the nuisance bylaw, I'm glad that uh, you are looking at uh, fining and, uh, I mean, going after the the people who actually cause the nuisance, not the property owner, because sometimes, um, you know, when you have a one-year tenant and you don't know you know, you may have a bunch of students that you think might be great tenants and it turned out that they are party people and they're going to leave in a few months. You can't even start an eviction process sometimes because you know it's not going to, you know, they're going to leave before that goes through. Um, so hopefully that won't stay in a property just because of that one group of bad people. And it, it, there is a possibility that you're going to have another group of rowdy people if you know, if you're not lucky enough to get good tenants, but hopefully um, whatever fines and, and punishments will go towards the perpetrator of the nuisance situation. Um, and yes, the property owner should be involved in creating a plan, but not lose their livelihood because of some, some bad apples. Thank you. And Happy retirement to John. I hope that he can pass on um, his perception in terms of who's responsible for what to whoever's going to follow him on this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Renata. Um, our next item of business is to discuss the... Um, follow-up to the joint CRC AMAHT meeting and there were a couple of questions that were posed to us and they were essentially um, a discussion to fit specific affordable housing recommendations into the manager's goals and to figure out some specific priorities to go along with that. That's one, one topic and then um, I'm looking at Shalini as I read the next one that the creating and developing or running a survey to an outreach on what types of housing people actually want. Um, as Pardon? Renata is still in the... Oh, um, okay. So I think I need to mute her. Oh, I need to ask you to unmute. No, I think you're good. Okay, she's muted. Sorry, Renata. I think you, yeah, you have to move her back into the audience to be consistent with how we. Yeah. Is that right? She's still here. Uh, if you can't, we'll survive. I mean, it's not a big deal. She uh, can do everything anyway, so. now. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, I didn't do that right. So I don't remember what Athena said. 
it's probably like a right click on the person's name. There should be an option when you right click it. Um, I think it said hide those who are not a panelist, so I hit her. <laughs> it's not <laughs> working. She's still there. <laughs> At least she. I hers. Renata is still in the audience, so no, she's still a panelist. Yeah, but she is muted, so she okay. will not be continuing to speak. Okay, the second the second item after the manager goals was creating a, a survey, talk about what people really want, and then figuring out what this what the demographic of twenty nine to forty nine year olds might want in Amherst. I would add besides a good job, what else might they want to keep them here? Um, and what investment does Amherst need to make to make that happen? Open up the floor for conversation. Jennifer. This is probably pie in the sky, but in the last um, you know, International Town Gown webinar that Paul sent us the link to, I was I mean, I thought it was, had never really, well, I shouldn't say never thought about, but when the University of Tennessee at Memphis, I guess it was their medical college, talked about that, I think they got a public-private partnership to actually build housing that also included employees of the university. I mean, since so many of the 29 to 40-year-olds that would live here or work for one, you know, two of the colleges or the university, if we, and since the university said they don't, really, you know, they're reluctant to build more student dorms on campus because of the demographic cliff and they don't know, you know, what the student enrollment is going to be going down the line, but they're always going to have university employees. If they could do a, maybe a public-private partnership for townhouses, apartments, whatever, for employees of the university, that would be also a great way of getting children in our schools and I don't know. So there was- If a, they were affordably priced, yeah. Right, if they were affordable, yes, not price like, if they were affordably priced. So I'm just wondering if that's- And, and if we allowed zoning changes that allowed duplexes, triplexes, et cetera, et cetera. Those are already allowed. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> no, but we're even thinking of like Gateway, which is in a RG area, you know, the gate, I mean, there's there's areas near town. And anyway, it would just yeah, no, uh, it's a it's a good idea. It's not a bad idea. So if they could be enticed to do that. <laughs> so, so Jennifer, maybe you could think about some way to sort of craft that into a manager uh, strategy or goal that we we could add in, and then I'm Shal and I'm going to call on you. Yeah. Um, I was thinking of two things. One is um, I, like hiring that person. I know we are hiring a half-time person to be an employee who will work with the Affordable Housing Trust, right? Yeah, if, if it actually gets used that way instead of just supporting yeah. the staff doing what they're doing. Yeah, but it would be nice. And since we don't have an economic development director and since this is part of development, but the kind of development we want to see, which is more housing for, and you know, that does raise our taxable ta uh, property taxes. So it is sort of an economic development and, but focusing. So if we had a person, even if it was half time or some hours who's focused on meeting with wayfinders, meeting with different people, finding out the different types of housing models, which we're starting to happen, right? With the gables and all of this we're starting to see but if there was a focused person who is really making those connections and inviting those kind of developments and supporting them i think that would be a really good investment and then secondly uh, back to the survey i again think it's really important because if you don't know what people need we may be solving for the wrong problem and i'm just speaking out of based on anecdotal data that having spoken to a few teachers who live in Leverett, and I was like, what would it take for you to live in Amherst? And when we say affordable housing, or let's say workforce housing, or, you know, and we, 
what I understood was that even if we provided housing here, they would not be able to get that kind of landscape and woods and you know that much space that they're getting the buck the value they're getting for that you know in leverage they're not going to get it here so will people so that's why i feel doing a survey with some open ended questions and some not open ended is really important to understand and hone into what can we build that will make it attractive for people sorry my reminder for composting okay <laughs> thank you <laughs> could i just get a clarification sort of a question and if um uh, if how if on the tennessee campus and i i did i don't remember whether this was addressed and so on the umass campus umass well with the public private partnership builds housing for students and also housing that includes staff, are we allowed to tax that? Because if we're not, then there is no revenue for the town there. So, you know, I think- uh, I think it's different it thing. For people, to, for schools and things, if maybe, but we don't gain any any tax base from it. We get no, but we have an more of an impact on our services, et cetera. So how would we address that? Oh, Pam, you go. But I do know that they're different. Sorry, like you go, but I'm going to say a few things. Yeah. Just, and that just I just feel curiosity. Some of that. My recollection is that is that no, they would not. The way it's structured now, no, they would not be taxed. Um, just like the new dorms are not taxed. Right we could oversee them if they were not operated by the university we could oversee them and, and inspect them etc um that said i think there is a push if i'm not mistaken to to uh adjust the pilot um formulas if if we are able to base it on on structure value rather than you know some nominal land land value and the reason I say that is that the campus has something like 13 million square feet of, of structure on the campus right now. And if that were taxed at even a, or if we got a pilot amount, even nominally on the, on the replacement value or insurance value of those structures, believe me, it would, it would solve a lot of problems. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But it's not going to happen. Yeah. Maybe that could be a town manager goal, though, to work on a. Right. Yeah, but I yeah, it could be a goal. But I think the other piece of it is we have Hampshire College and Amherst College, and they they own single family homes that they rent to their staff uh, and their fac their faculty. I don't know if they rent to their cleaners, et cetera, but they do rent to faculty, and they that is not taxed. But see that. It seems to me that we should be able to tax with the private colleges those residences at a rate, at a, at a resident residential tax rate, tax rate. So I'd like to see the town manager be working on that, as well as you know saying, oh well, we're going to go to UMass and we're going to get more pilot money. Um, yeah, we can put that in there, but it ain't going to happen. Um, I mean. <laughs> Yeah. I, I would double check to make sure I, I actually thought that Amherst College properties um, were taxed. Uh, those those residences were taxed. I, I could I be wrong. Be wrong. I don't I know I could be wrong. So it'd be great for us to find out. That would be good. Yeah. Thank you. I do think that different actually it's not always the case that it will be tax exempt. Uh, my understanding is that that it it's just the way this was structured. Like if it's a nonprofit that owns, then like who's doing the pri There's some way that they got around it, but it's not always the case. I think we the town can tax in public private. I think they um, can too. I mm. think you can find like. I mean, let's say it was, is Gateway, is is yeah. that owned by the university, that slab what? of grass? Yeah, yeah, that's it is. Grass. It is, okay. 
But parts of it, isn't it owned by Shambhe and all parts of those? I'm not sure. But I thought part of it was private. Well, the land no. is the land from um, Mercy Church, uh -huh. which is uh, closest to, to Triangle Street. Um, from there to the sorority is um, is UMass land. Then there's the little sorority. And then UMass starts again um, where they have their entrance sign right near Butterfield Terrace Road. Okay. I mean, there has to be a way we can do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The qu I had a question too, though. And what about Ball Lane? If Ball Lane is is that tax, you know, if that becomes um, owner occupied, you know, owned property, that would that would pay normal property tax, I would guess, right? Yeah, I think so. And and then I mean, uh, East Gables must be paying property tax. Yeah. Okay. That's that was the second. I I'm not a hundred percent, you know, again, it's like, that's what I've been assuming, but I think that's again, worth clarifying for ourselves. So yeah. I was told that new house for the Hampshire college president is being taxed because that he's still using the other house to, as um, where he entertains and does business. And this residence on sunset is just his residence. That's Amherst yeah. college, not Hampshire college. Yes. Amherst yeah. College president, yeah. so they are paying taxes, which is good. Are you sure of that? You know, I, Mandy told me that, and I thought maybe that she was probably her right. <laughs> She's got such a great mind. Um, so that's a good question. So that that um, so Jennifer, were you going to draft something up, or as a as a group? I, I will do that. Yeah, I will. Maybe we just send our comments to Jennifer as sort of ideas and, and comments. And I'm going to go back and listen to that webinar to see what they did in Tennessee. Yeah, like, I should do that. Is that public too. or private land? Anyway, I'll go back and listen. Yeah, because it was right on the campus, right on the, the edge. Yeah, and the and the campus that helped keep the price down because the because the it was campus land, and they right. said the the developer took all the risk. Right. And then in 50 years, it would revert to the university. Which is what Fieldstone does. Yeah. Right, right. Um, do you want to talk briefly about a survey and and who might who might initiate this? Is that something that CRC take takes on? Um, or CRC with with the housing trust? to develop a, uh, some questions? Are we, are we what we want to start developing a survey? Would it be planning board also or no? Is it again? Well, uh, would that, should we include the planning board also in the, or just affordable housing trust? I don't know. Planning board might have some thoughts on it because they are starting to talk about you know, sort of looking in depth at, at opportunities for housing. Right. Right. Because especially thinking in terms of what areas are for what and where might different people prefer to live. Do they want to be closer to downtown? Do they want to be closer to the university? Do they want to be closer to the school? You know what? So I think planning board is it might make sense to include them, at least in the initial conversation to see what their interest is. Mm -hmm. um, I I could draft up a little note that comes from, oh, you know, well, I'm sure Mandy would want to look at it mm -hmm. as well, um, to the planning board for just as a conversation topic. And I might add that. Oh, I'm I, have... I could do that. Oh, <laughs> okay. There you go. Uh, I think Mandy Jo and I had, actually drawn up questions long ago and I'll go back and look at them because that survey was going to look at asking people what do you love living about living in Amherst what do you not love and you know things like that and what stops you from wanting to uh, from being able to live here so and then we never used that survey we ended up creating more of the rental registration one so I'll go and look at that because we may already have a pretty good state uh, you know, survey already half designed. Yeah, good. 
Yeah, I think have... the hard, yeah, the hard part is the analysis, as we saw. And this time, like I've learned from last time, there should be two people looking at it. Maybe if they're two different bodies, like especially if it's like affordable and planning board and us, then that would make it easier. There's no conflict or quorum problems and all that. And we could have three sets of eyes looking at the survey results. Um, so I will, let me just look at my calendar, sorry. Um, I'm gonna be out of town for a couple of weeks, but we have a CRC meeting on the 21st and, and I'd be happy to at least draft up a, uh, a statement that could be- When do we have a CRC meeting? On the 21st of, August, of September. Oh, September. Oh, okay. Because I was thought you said August. Okay. Way ahead. No, way ahead. Um, and maybe by then we could we could have something that we would be happy to send along to the planning board to say, you know, um, have you given any thought to the kind of housing or the locations of housing that people might want? Is that really what we're asking them? I think. Can you say that again? Dear planning board, what what kind of housing do you think people want anyway? Mm -hmm. I'm crafting my I'm sorry. I think you really need to ask people. Get affordable. Uh, uh, you know, there are all kinds of people, uh, students, not, you know, I'm not even talking about students right now. I'm only talking about families um, or partnerships or stuff like that. Households, and yeah. Households, thank you. That's great. That's much better. Um, so how are you going to get it to households um, that are people who participate in the mobile market because they have to? Yet they're they're renting, they're paying rent, or maybe some of them even own. Um, I know some of the people who come to the survival center own their homes. Um, but need to be there. So how are we going to get it out to those folks? Otherwise, it's just the usual folks that we address. And we're not going to learn anything about new about housing or ne real needs if we only ask those of us that are already on council committees, et cetera, et cetera. What if we had um, paper surveys that you could take to the mobile market? That'd be interesting. And they'd have to be in, in uh, at least Spanish. Different languages, yeah. Yeah. But just think about all the additional work we're adding because well, you got to... if you want to reach people, okay, pass besides it. just the regular folks who answer, I hear you, I hear you. But I was the one who spent hours and I, I appreciate that, and you, you won't be but this time. By the time it's why? done, you won't be here. Wait, but... that's not the point. Whatever I'm doing is for always the good of everyone. So anyway, my point being not that it's, it's not, not an. E it's not an either or path. Like all I'm saying is let's you rate me want to reach more people. I'm bringing out another challenge or obstacle and it's not either or we can find a new way. Maybe we sit with iPads and have them enter it there. We need to find a solution instead of just saying, Oh, what are we going to do then? Or, you know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. And what I'm talking about is finding ways to be inclusive to people that normally- 100%. Don't get. Excuse 100%. me, I'm talking now. Okay. All right, go ahead. Excuse me, you were both talking over each other, so- Yeah, okay. I'm gonna stop because this is an asshole conversation. Um, no, I think Pat, we're trying to hear you. You're talking about the outreach strategies. And I think Shalini had started talking about um, um, sort of the, the types of housing. Oh, no, it's too much work and it's not. C can I speak now? I'm 100% all about the inclusion and I'm saying that I'm 100% with you that we need to get more people who do not speak and and we have to consider the fact that we do not have the town staff. We are going to have to do it and how do we get those people and consider the staff? I'm not saying because it's a lot of work, we should not do it. I'm saying that it is a lot of work. So let us think about, let's think through how do we get more people? And in terms of getting different people, also I was thinking of using maybe the schools as a way to send it out to the teachers or firefighters, you know, send it to the heads of the departments to send it out to their people and to go to mobile markets and get 
So definitely, I'm not ruling. I'm talking about churches. I'm talking about, you know, BBA and all these different associations reaching out to them so that they can st send it out to their people. Family outreach. We actually did do family outreach for uh, um, for the rental registration and where the person over there, I forget her name, she was helping the people fill it out. So there are ways to do it. I'm not saying it's a lot of work, so we shouldn't do it, but I just don't appreciate that you would automatically assume that that's what I'm saying is because it's a lot of work. I'm not interested in doing a, an inclusive job. That's what I was uh, reacting to because we're both saying the same thing. Pat, are you are you good with that? Or are you okay? Okay. Um, it sounds like there is definitely work to be done, and probably the twenty first of August is the time that this that this, if I remember, that this topic comes back up again, or it should be anyway, if we want to keep it moving. Um, so I'm going to switch gears and and ask if anyone wants to make a motion that we adopt the August 3, 2023 meeting minutes. Were there any corrections to those that need to be made? No corrections? Then I move that we adopt the August 3, 2023 meeting minutes. Second. And, okay. All in favor, let's see. Shalini. Uh, abstaining, just because I wasn't there. I did read them, but I'm abstaining. Pat? Aye. Jennifer? Yes. And Pam is also a yes. So those pass with one abstention. And um, I don't have absent. I don't have. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. One, one abstention and one absent. Great, thank you. Um, I'm not going to preview the next agenda because that's the chair's thing. And there were no items that were 24 hours in advance that I'm aware of. I don't have any announcements. And I would, does anybody have any last minute, anything you want to add to the conversation? No, you had said the 21st, but we are meeting on the 7th, right? Our meeting on the seventh. I may or may not be able to make right. it. So we yeah. will pick up the nuisance bylaw then. I think. I think uh, Mandy said she. I should have it ready. I should have our corrections or our notes for it ready for the seventh. But that it's pretty likely that it won't get discussed until the twenty first. Okay. The end so, of the year is getting I, really close. <laughs> So I'll try to I'll try to get those corrections made in in sort of a clean text, and um, and put that back in the doc in the in our packet for next time. Okay, thank you. Any other additions corrections? Can we adjourn early? <laughs> for adjourning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you shared a really well, great meeting. Well done. Yeah. yeah. Well done for putting at six eighteen. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. The CRC.